Hello everyone and welcome to the latest session in our um, series of webinars to provide you with the information that you've requested in terms of Ofsted inspection. Some of you probably know me already, but my name's Lee Austin. I'm one of His Majesty's inspectors and I'm delighted to be Ofsted's National Director of Education and continuing to be the face of our webinar series. Um, in this session, as we have a spotlight for every session, we're focusing particularly on the inspections of small schools, which I know has been a topic of debate over recent months. We've been undertaking lots of work behind the scenes over the last, say, 12, 12 months or so. And we're in a position now to be able to share with you some of the information, not only that we're sharing with you as the sector, but information, and in a lot of cases, exactly the same slides that we've been sharing with our inspector workforce. So that there isn't anything that's hidden there isn't anything that's secret. As we tell our inspectors, we're obviously tonight telling you exactly the same information. As I've said before, we've put together this series of webinars to enable you to hear directly from us. We want you to hear directly from Ofsted whenever it's about Ofsted, because we recognise that there can be lots of other third parties out there, often very expensive, that want to share with you things that we do or do not do. And again, it's important that you hear it directly from us and you see I suppose you see the human beings behind the Ofsted brand, myself as the National Director, but also my colleagues that you will hear from in just a moment. Just to make you aware, this is the very first webinar that you've been dialing into. We've held several of these over the last two years or so. All of them are available on our YouTube channel for you to access. And obviously we'll be holding more of these sessions in the future because we know how popular they have been. And in particular, we'll be working more to bring you exactly the training that we've provided to our inspectors directly to you um, in a more accessible format over our webinar programme as the summer term after Easter progresses. So please do look out for those on social media. But as I said, I'm not alone in terms of delivering this webinar. You can see our glorious photographs there on the screen and you can see in terms of um, our cameras what we look like in real life. Hopefully not too much difference. Um, I'm going to allow my colleagues to introduce themselves briefly um, before we move on to the rest of the session. So can I hand over to Richard first in terms of the order that we're presented on the slide? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Richard Quay. I'm one of His Majesty's inspectors and I work with Lee closely as Deputy Director for schools and early education. It's great to be with you this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Di Mullen. I'm a senior HMI in the East Midlands region. I, I, my name's Claire Jones. Um, I am an HMI and also a specialist advisor in the schools and early education policy, quality and training team. And apologies for being the person that forgot to go off mute. Don't worry, we don't have any hands up, so there's no legacy. Is that a legacy hand um, on this evening's webinar? So thank you. Um, what we'll do is we'll turn our cameras off in just a moment. Um, don't be put off by that. That's so that you can spend most of your time and attention on the slides that, that come along. And I'll tell you in a little moment about how you can have access to some of those slides because it is the number one question we get asked. So I'm going to answer that right at the start in a moment. Um, but we will turn our cameras off. And then I'll kind of take us through the introduction before I hand over to my colleagues. And before I do just share some of the information around key resources, just to say, while there are kind of four of us on camera at the moment, or four of us that you'll be hearing from, can I just extend my thanks to everybody else in Ofsted who's working behind the scenes. I often call them the webinar elves who work really hard to make sure that we can bring this to you this evening. So thank you to them. OK, I'm just going to turn my camera off and I invite my colleagues to do the same but you will hear from various, um, various folk as the session progresses. So um, the only guidance and materials you need for an inspection are the guidance and materials that we produce at Ofsted, and we publish a variety of those, variety of content to support you, and you can find all of that at our gov.uk forward slash Ofsted address. Obviously, we have our inspection handbooks, which outline our policies and processes for school inspection, but we also publish a variety of other guidance documents that are intended both for you as those in the sector, as well as our own inspectors. And those can all be found on gov.uk. You might not be as well aware of some of the other channels of communication that we have. So you'll see our particular site or address for YouTube. 
which is where I said earlier all of our previously recorded webinars exist if you wanted to have a look at our growing library of resources as well as some of the slides that we've put on SlideShare over time. And then from time to time if there's a particular issue that we want to address and often that comes directly from you either through an event like this or through other communication mechanisms we publish some blogs or press releases to delve deeper into a particular topic. And lastly, if you do have any questions or concerns, you know, please don't hesitate to get uh, in contact with us directly. You can find our contact us details on our website. But I couldn't let the opportunity pass without just reminding you all, and I hope this is a very familiar phrase, um, without reminding you that we recently have launched our big listen. We launched that on the 8th of March. Um, it is something that will progress for the next um, few weeks and months as we try to understand as much as possible in terms of how you, the sector and other professionals and parents and children feel about Ofsted in terms of the inspections that we conduct. It's our absolute ambition to be a world-class inspectorate and we recognise that to be a world-class inspectorate we need the confidence and we need the trust of the professions and the professionals that we work with on inspection, the sectors that we inspect. And you'll see that in terms of this slide. It is absolutely a comprehensive effort to hear from everyone that has a vested interest in the processes that we undertake in inspecting schools or indeed any of the other remits or provision that we inspect or regulate. Now, obviously, I'm talking to yourselves tonight as professionals, as fellows within the, within the profession, but it's important that we also hear from all of the other stakeholders, um, as you said, as you saw there, in terms of parents and children themselves. And we will be launching a children's survey in the coming weeks so that we can gather their views in particular. What is the big listen? Well, it's just that. It's an exercise in terms of listening to the feedback. It is absolutely about hearing the criticism and then obviously all of the ideas and reforms for whether those are small changes or, or big reforms as the as the slide suggests. It is important that we listen, but it's also important that you hear from me as the National Director of Education that the listening will come to an end and then we will have some action that needs to be taken. But we want to ensure that the action we take is absolutely the right steps to ensure that inspection serves the purpose of maintaining high standards and positive outcomes for all children but at the same time addresses the challenges that we know exist, both for you as the individuals that experience inspection, and obviously what that means in terms of the wider accountability system. So, as you can expect, we will carefully analyse any of the responses that come through. And we've also already had many, um, many thousands of responses, and we anticipate that to increase even further as the big listen gets underway. There are four specific elements. Um, the main way through is through our consultation survey, of which you can I'll, I'll provide you with a, a, a access point in a moment. But essentially, it's looking at four main themes. How do we report our findings? How do we carry out inspections? How can we continue to have a positive impact on the sectors we inspect, however you determine that positive impact or whatever you determine that positive impact to mean? And what can we do, as I've just said, to be that world class inspectorate and regulator? that we have as a real ambition, trusted by parents, children, and the sectors we work with. There are also some independently led surveys, and obviously the, the organizations that we've engaged with to do that independent work for us, will be hosting um, focus groups, stakeholder groups, to get more in-depth responses face-to-face. -face. And of course, all of the other events, and webinars such as this that we hold from time to time where we'll be out and about listening to your responses and working with you to have the important debate that is needed. So here's the screen and I'll just linger on this screen a little um, because if you want to scan that QR code then by all means do. It will take you to um, our Ofsted Big Listen page. You can see the web address in the bottom left of the phone and of course it closes on the 31st of May 2024. So please do. Genuinely, we are interested in what everybody has to say, because once we've had the big listen, then hopefully we will um, respond with those small changes or even those big reforms that people say are needed. But now let's turn to the topic of this webinar again. 
um, turning our attention to the session and the aims for today. And over the next 45 minutes or so, we obviously want to explain how we as inspectors consider the context of a school, and in particular, the context of a small school. We'll be outlining some of the opportunities and challenges that small schools face as they try and develop high quality education. And we'll also outline how Ofsted inspectors will consider this context when on graded or ungraded inspections of small schools. And of course, hopefully, there'll be plenty of time at the end to answer the questions that you've either previously submitted or the questions that you could submit at any time as we progress through the slides of the webinar. And of course, just, an, an, just access that through the, um, the panel at the side of the webinar screen. Now, as I said earlier, the number one question we always get asked is, when will the slides be available? And yes, you absolutely can have the slides. Please don't feel you need to take copious notes um, while listening today. They will be emailed to you shortly after the session has ended. So without further ado, let's get into some of the detail and particularly how we consider the context of any school, but particularly given tonight's theme, the context of a small school. So first, I think it's important to say that, as the title suggests, you know, understanding context isn't particular to small schools. We do want to understand the context that any school finds themselves within. But of course, tonight we've got that particular lens of small schools. I also just want to make you aware that one of the key themes, one of the key sessions of our current Spring Inspector Conference is exactly this question. How do we consider the context of a school in the way in which we go about our inspection work? So not only is it topical in terms of you, those within the sector, but it's also a very live topic that we are discussing in terms of an inspection workforce. And indeed, some of the slides that you will see, as I said earlier, are an exact replica of the slides that we've been using with our inspectors to share the exact same information. So we know it's important to be clear that the context of a school, no matter its shape, size or location, is important because actually a school's context influences all of the decisions that you as school leaders and as teachers make on a day-to-day -day basis and the actions that you take. And we need to use that as the lens through which we evaluate how, how successful all of those actions and decisions have been in terms of the lived reality in classrooms and ultimately the difference that they're making to the children in your care. So on inspection, it's crucial that we understand the backdrop in which school leaders are working. What are your challenges, whether those are national ones, regional ones or local to your particular context, and then to be able to accurately evaluate, as I said, the decisions and actions that you take. So what do we mean by context? Well, it can be the external factors, such as where your school is located. It can be the particular community that you serve, the pupils who attend. It can be things like pupil stability. And in terms of small schools, we know with smaller numbers of pupils that stability can have a significant impact on the decisions that you're making. But it can also be internal factors like how your school is organized, how it is structured, staffing, recruitment, premises. The one thing we hear time and time again, which is really important in small schools, the many multiple hats that individual members of staff or leaders wear, and therefore being conscious as an inspection team, that if we want to speak to certain individuals about the work that they do, that can often be the same person, and we want to be conscious of their well-being and welfare and not overburdening them in terms of the influence or impact of an inspection. And Di's gonna to talk to you um, a little bit later about how we con consider the context of small schools um, in particular in a few slides time. So how is context set out in our handbooks? Well, paragraph six, I think as it currently stands, you can see it there on the screen, reminds us that we need to balance consistency in inspection with the flexibility required to respond to those individual circumstances. So that reasonable consistency that we can all expect through following a standardised framework and handbook and methodology, but with enough wriggle room within it so that we can understand precisely what it is that makes your school unique. And we know that's what any leader wants to get across to an inspection team. What are the strengths and weaknesses? 
what are the successes and even better ifs that we can put across, we can put our best foot forward and share with the inspection team when they arrive. So in balancing consistency with flexibility, you know, we're not diluting the education inspection framework, but we are trying to apply it consistently and fairly while taking note of the different circumstances in which everybody is working. So how do we get that information then about context in particular? Well, first and foremost, you can see on the screen, there's a lot of information that inspectors will have access to before you even know an inspection is happening. And that's not months or years before your inspection. Inspectors, lead inspectors in particular, only get this information a few days before um, they make the phone call to your school. But there obviously is a range of information that we can use. And obviously we want to use that to build a rounded view of your context. And you can see some of the sources there. And that information will give inspectors insights into such things as your school type, its size, the characteristics of pupil cohorts. For example, are there any differences in year groups between um, special educational needs and disabilities, free school meals? It'll give them some sense, and I do say some sense, um, of the scale of perhaps deprivation in the locality in which you're working, but it'll also give them some information around staffing, around pupils behaviour attendance and their previous academic achievement if we think about the inspection data summary report in particular. But importantly, all of that information is historic. It's information that's been collected and published, but it's about a past snapshot in time. And obviously the most important um, information we hold is the information that you can give us directly in conversation through discussion from that very first phone call where it's important to get across to the lead inspector exactly what the challenges are and how you've tried to manage those in terms of the decisions and choices that you've made as a leader and indeed all inspectors all lead inspectors when they make that phone call and again this was a topic of our spring conference this year particularly asking about those challenges and the context in which you are all working. So if you are yet to have an inspection or you're anticipating one, then of course you will be having a conversation just about this. And of course, it doesn't answer any questions, it just raises them. So again, while we might be interested in some of the information that's shared either through these reports or through conversation, it's only the start of a process and then it'll be about seeing what that looks like in reality and obviously what that means in terms of the difference the schools your hard work are making to the children in your care so we don't want you to do lots of preparation work for this part of the conversation the telephone conversation that happens before inspectors arrive on site but we do just want to talk to you about your school and its context because the number one thing we often hear is will the inspectors who are walking up the path get it Will they understand the school in which I work and the decisions I've made? And therefore, we've put front and centre through our training programme this spring, and obviously in terms of what we're sharing with you now, that yes, they will be having discussions around your school and its context. And in terms of what that means for small schools, I'm now going to hand over to Richard and later the rest of the team to give you a little bit more of the detail. Richard, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Lee, and good afternoon, everyone. So it might be helpful for me to begin by outlining what we mean by a small primary school. It's one of our, our frequently asked questions. So we take the, the number of 150 as the point at which we regard a primary school to be a small school, and that's aligned to what's stated in, a, in the school inspection handbook, for example, in paragraphs 122 and 124. And there are around um, 3,800 maintained small primary schools, including nursery, infant and junior schools. That represents broadly about uh, one in five, 20 percent of the primary schools that we inspect. And in the region of 1,600 provide education for 50 to 100 pupils and around 450 provide education for fewer than 50. But as, as Lee's alluded to, we know that each school has its own unique context. It might be rural, coastal, town or urban context, um, or, or it might be providing education for predominantly white British cohorts of pupils or for a diverse and changing pupil population. And we know that, a, a, that in a fair few of the small schools um, that we're likely to meet a teaching head teacher and come across mixed age classes 
in some cases covering entire key stages um, and in a few spanning key stages. And as you'd expect, small schools differ in their contexts um, and within seemingly uh, similar surface features. There are, are contextual factors that we need to be mindful of. And we'll come on to these later in the webinar. And, um, and forgive me for, for repeating the point that's been said before, but we as inspectors, we've, we are and we, we will be and we have to be cognizant of each school's unique context. So let's just reflect for a moment about you know, what it means to, to lead and, and, and work in a, a small school. An analogy we sometimes use and we talk about with our inspectors is that leading any school can often feel like sailing a ship or a boat, a captain working with uh, and, a, and leading a crew, sailing a clearly defined course. However, at times, um, uh, you know, as leaders of those schools, we encounter cross currents and waves as well as smoother waters. And in this analogy, small schools are akin to, to agile, smaller boats, um, each having a smaller crew, fewer passengers, often operating in a more confined space. And due to a small size and likely more limited resources, the impact of changing context around um, them is likely to be amplified. Taking that boat analogy further, even small changes in, in the current or ripples in water may well have broader consequences. So to changes in context for a small school may have a more significant impact on curriculum design, for example. Similarly, if, if one teacher is absent or the school is carrying one vacancy, the impact will be considerably greater. But on the other hand, there are a range of opportunities and advantages for a small school in its agility and how it adapts its provision. And we've identified some key opportunities as well as challenges that school, small schools routinely face in developing a high quality of education. And we'll consider uh, some of these over the next couple of slides. So here we have captured some of the most common opportunities that align to developing the quality of education. I'll just give you a moment or two to, to have a look at what's on the slide there. And your own leadership or teaching experience might tell you that there are many, many more beyond these. And we know that a small school does not automatically mean small class sizes. It's not uncommon to come across classes of 25 to 30 or even more uh, pupils in some small schools. And while the statements on this slide are true of very many small schools, they are dependent on several undercurrents. For example, staff experience and knowledge, the physical space that you have in the school, and the extent and frequency of changes to pupil cohorts. And some of these opportunities may also present as, as challenges or provide um, a, a distorted view of, of provision or how stakeholders view the work of the school. And we know to treat data based on small numbers with suitable caution and to seek more information from, from you as the leaders of small schools. So we get that important rounded view of your provision that Lee talked about earlier. And let me just draw your attention to the first four bullets. Consider how these opportunities support leaders and teachers who, you know, who may well be the same people to develop a curriculum that's uh, aligned closely to people's needs and capability. This is the kind of important contextual information that we want to understand and the lead inspector will want to understand right from the start of your inspection. And each of these uh, opportunities also need to be viewed in the light of challenges that small schools can face, which we'll see on, some, on the next slide. And I'll just give you a moment or two, or two to read through these. And as with the opportunities that we looked at just, just now, you will no doubt think of many more based on your experience. Each school that we visit has its own bespoke challenges, However, we've distilled um, these challenges down to some of those which, which may influence or impact upon the development and delivery of a high quality curriculum. The first three bullets um, influence how, how classes are organized, how the curriculum is constructed, taught and evaluated. And we would want to understand that in the context of your individual school. And reflecting on the discussions that you'd want inspectors to, to have with you in order to understand how the nature of pupil cohorts, staff roles, and the school's location and physical size, all of these, how they influence curriculum design, how it's delivered and its impact. And we're aware that all schools experience changes. And in small schools, the impact of these changes can be amplified or exaggerated. 
So while small schools operate in the same educational waters as larger schools, their size and individual context means that they face different opportunities and challenges. Seemingly small changes may have a more significant set of consequences, including those on class composition and curriculum design. And what's important is that we, uh, as inspectors, are able to understand and keep the school's context in mind. So, um, as Lee was saying before, so that we can adapt, but not um, dilute the education inspection framework as we inspect to it. And as we go about evaluating the quality of education that your school offers. And in this way, um, we, we seek to be consistent, but also proportionate in our inspections. And, and building on that previous point, schools, irrespective of their size, do face some irreducible demands, such as the need to deliver the national curriculum or a curriculum that matches the breadth and ambition of the national curriculum, that prepares pupils for their next steps of education. Um, and, and, and that is something that is ir an irreducible demand. The obvious and stark difference is that schools have considerably fewer resources upon which to draw. And there's also the issue of amplification. Concerns, successes, strengths and weaknesses can appear exaggerated in a small school. And what we'll aim to do is to consider inspection in this light. And we know that the process of, of inspection itself is a form of pressure that's different to the pressure of day-to-day -day running of a small school for, for leaders, for staff and for those responsible for governance. We're aware that in small schools, we're very likely to be spending more time on inspection with one particular person and and will be mindful of that person's well-being and of other demands on their workload and time and our aim is to work with leaders to craft an inspection that's responsive to that individual school circumstances and we'll be mindful of this as we plan and go about our inspection activity and linked to this, I think it's probably worthwhile having a reminder of Ofsted's code of conduct, which sets out the expectations of, of, of both providers, yes, but also inspectors. And we'll conduct our work with integrity, demonstrating professionalism and treating all those that we meet with courtesy, empathy and respect. That is our, that's our code of conduct. That's our focus. And as part of this, we'll also be alert to the well-being of leaders and staff as we go about doing our inspection work. And as I said before, in small schools, we might be spending much more time with the same leader or teacher. And we want to be mindful of this as we draw up the plan of inspection activities to do that uh, um, in a way that's, that's um, doing it with you, that we're doing it together, um, and as we enact that um, inspection timetable too. So Di and I will now um, talk in a little bit more detail about the inspection of small schools in particular. And over the next few moments, we'll be speaking to you about how we evaluate the quality of education in small schools. And in doing so, we'll refer back to some of the aspects that Lee talked about earlier. So I might begin by drawing your attention to five C's that um, may uh, require particular consideration when we're carrying out inspections of small schools. And, and I should just, just stress that we, we don't expect you to, to use these terms when you talk to us. Um, and indeed, inspectors may themselves not use these terms that I'm referring to in the presentation now as they carry out their inspection work. Um, and indeed, uh, connecting to, to what Lee said before, we don't expect you to carry out lots of preparation for an inspection. But, but what I'm doing here is just outlining a few themes that are considered um, when we frame our discussions with you as leaders. And indeed, they might frame some of the discussions that you have with inspectors. So in brief, these are some of the areas that might be helpful to consider as, um, as, as areas that you might wish to communicate to an inspector during an inspection. The first one is that context is crucial. So let's look at context and build on, on what's been said earlier, that context is just so crucial from the very start of an inspection. This is the case for any school. It's not a small school only message, but it is very pertinent for small schools. Inspectors always need to respond to the individual circumstances of that. And as we've just looked through, we have to be mindful of the exaggerated impact that seemingly small changes have to the context uh, of a school. And understanding from the start of an inspection 
is really crucial. So inspectors will want to take the time to understand the context of your school and they'll ask you questions about that context. There's no particular set list of questions that inspectors will always ask, but these are some of the areas they might be interested in exploring with you. So do have a look at those on the slide um, that's up there at the moment and I'll explore some of these in a little more detail. So school location. Inspectors will, will want to hear from you about your community, how it's influenced your decision making, for example, um, how um, you've gone about shaping your curriculum, off, curriculum offer. Or perhaps these are areas, uh, there are areas of personal development that you choose to find. And in terms of pupil cohorts, we'd be really very keen to know about any changes in the numbers of pupils attending your school, not only what the figures are, but it's also important that we understand the, the decisions that you've made or have had to make. And in very, uh, in very small schools, we know that leaders might be redesigning their curriculum annually, where pupil numbers fluctuate, for example, where the composition of mixed age classes may alter from uh, three year groups to four. And still with pupil cohorts, we know that a small change in the number of pupils with SEND, for example, might have a significant implication for your school. And it's important that we understand how, how you as leaders ensure these pupils receive the support they need to access the curriculum. We'd also want to know about staffing, not only just as context, but also to help with the organisation of the inspection. And we'll come back to this a little bit later on. As Lee mentioned before, we'll look at your IDSR um, as part of um, our pre-inspection preparation and also maybe discuss aspects of that with you on the inspection itself. But we do so with caution. And, and the reason for that, as you might expect, is because we have to be cautious when it comes to um, dealing with data sets based on small numbers. We know that one or two pupils having low attendance can make a big impact um, uh, to uh, percentages. And, and as Lee alluded to at the start, this information only gives us a starting point. It gives us questions to ask. For example, we want to hear from you about your context and approach to attendance. And during our discussions, we'll keep in mind what you tell us about, um, about uh, your context in specific um, relation to the impact of COVID-19. And we recognise that responding to um, to COVID-19 during the pandemic period has placed great demands on leaders and detailed discussions around this might be needed to understand the ongoing legacy of that impact in some schools. And it's important that we understand your, your approach might be uh, different to different subjects, to checking the quality of education on the theme of curriculum. And we'd be particularly interested to know um, how, for instance, your quality assurance looks um, in your context, which might be very different from a quality assurance approach in a much larger school. So sticking with the theme of curriculum, I'm now gonna hand over to Di, who'll take us on to the next section. Thank you, Richard. Now we know that providing a high quality education for pupils in mixed age classes is really challenging. And we're going to want to understand how you have constructed your curriculum, including around mixed age classes, if you have them in your school. And we are aware that we might hear different terms, such as thematic approach, rolling cycles or curriculum drivers. And we recognise that these are terms that leaders may use to communicate with their staff. Our roles as inspectors is to be neutral to these as concepts and to understand what this actually means, and ultimately the impact on the rounded view of education that pupils receive. We also need to understand the role that commercial schemes play so we will be interested in whether and how you have adapted these schemes for mixed age classes and the impact that this is having. That said, if the scheme already provides these adaptations, then we have no further expectations that the school will have adapted them anymore. There is nothing wrong with using a curriculum off the peg, so to speak, as long as it is leading to a good quality of education. And we know that in a school with mixed age classes, the curriculum is likely to look different than it will in a school which teaches pupils in single age classes. One of the most significant challenges that leaders of small schools face is designing a progression model for two, three, or sometimes even four or more year groups and the individual needs 
that exist within them. So it may be that approaches will differ by subject. So for example, there may be pupils in each year group working to different learning objectives in the same mixed age class. We might see this in hierarchical subjects, such as mathematics or computing, or we might see all pupils seemingly learning the same substantive knowledge. So for example, about the Great Fire of London or about settlements, but they are applying different subject specific knowledge or skills. And we might see that in history, art, geography, for example. What we're interested in is knowing what approach you have taken and why. Then we draw on evidence from pupils' work, lesson visits and discussions with pupils and with their teachers to evaluate the impact of the curriculum and to find out what is leading to that impact. We also understand that you, as leaders of small schools, often draw upon expertise from outside of your own school staff. And so we will seek to establish early on in the inspection process whether and to what extent this is the case. So for example, we would want to understand where subject leadership is perhaps being shared across federated schools or perhaps subject leadership is being supported or provided from within a multi-academy trust, or perhaps individual leaders or teachers, including those who may be part-time, are taking subject leadership responsibility for several subjects. And we need to understand all of this because we must meet with the right. You may ask that we meet with school staff and trust staff, or staff that work in a federated school. And this may mean that some subject leader meetings take place later in the school day rather than at the beginning of the school day. So perhaps after other elements of the deep dive have taken place. It may be that we meet with more than one person about a subject and all of that is absolutely fine. As paragraph 28 in our handbook makes clear, the focus of inspections is on schools and how all the individuals within them work together to make sure children receive the highest possible quality of education. The focus is not on inspecting a specific individual who works in a school. So back to this image with a slightly different focus. In some small schools, there will be classes that include pupils not only from one year group, but they may be from more than one key stage and we will give careful consideration where this is the case. For example, when early years and key stage one children are together in one class. And we will want to understand how these cross key stage classes affect the design of your curriculum and the decisions you make about supporting teachers and other staff to teach your curriculum. And we'll certainly want to understand how you have made sure that pupils in both phases are getting the support they need in age appropriate ways. So for example, that children in the early years develop those foundational knowledge and skills that they absolutely need. We've entitled this C, Checking Impact, not just because it begins with C, but also to intentionally avoid using words such as monitoring or assessment, which might be seen as loaded terms. So perhaps the word considering might be even more apt. Paragraph 346 of our handbook outlines the areas where leaders can have the strongest effect on the quality of education. Included in this are high expectations, a focus on education and creating coherence and consistency across the school. And we know we might not see the level of formality that some larger schools might have so we might not see reports with lots and lots of analysis or subject monitoring happening at certain times each and every week or term. And that's fine. We want to know how effective your approach is. We have no preference as to what it looks like. We might see checking happening as part of informal weekly staff meetings, for example, because we know that the total number of teachers in some small schools may well be far fewer than the number of senior, senior leaders in a larger school. We might also see collaborators as a significant contributor to checking impact, and so involving them in discussions will also be important. We might also find that you are aware that a certain subject hasn't been checked for a few weeks, 
because you may have been focusing on other subjects or there may be some concerns around capacity and we recognize this so it would be important to have a conversation about how all this fits into your broader plan the important thing here is that we will want to know what you are doing and how this is informing you about your curriculum and how well it is being learned impact is important and a proportional focus on impact gives us that rounded view in a small school as with any school we are ultimately interested in the impact that your school is having on the education that the children receive and therefore what pupils know remember and can do so if impact is weak it is reasonable to ask if there are weaknesses in the intent or implementation that might explain this and if impact is strong it is also reasonable to ask if there are strengths in the intent or implementation which might explain that in most cases we will see evidence of impact in published outcomes in small schools we will use this information with great caution as numbers will be small and we will want to understand the context behind those published outcomes often information about outcomes will be suppressed in which case we may not see any of this before coming on site and we're careful not to over extrapolate before the inspection starts so we gather evidence as we go on inspection any published data is only ever a starting point for further conversations and a rounded view of the impact of your school so we will want to know are children learning your curriculum the one that you as leaders have so carefully designed all the more important that we have the opportunity to explore quality in real time with you on inspection and to look at the impact of learning over time and there is an added complexity of course when evaluating impact when we come across mixed age classes so we will seek to understand how you have planned for progression and we will not place too much weight on what may be surface features so for example pupils in one class of a four-year group all together appearing to be studying the same content and of course these points all have implications for what happens on inspection and inspectors will create a bespoke timetable alongside leaders that reflects the context of their school we look at quality of education through the subjects that pupils learn in the curriculum and we're guided by the fact that the national curriculum is shaped around subjects and that pupils in academies are required to learn a curriculum of similar breadth and ambition we will carry out three deep dives on ungraded inspections and this is generally sufficient on a graded inspection of a small school too depending on what is possible inspectors will be able to collect evidence about the quality of education outside of a deep dive this may be based on discussions with you about your school and it may well include pupils with special educational needs and disabilities and how well some individuals are achieving or it might be a focus on literacy across the school or an evaluation of the quality of work in some further foundation subject it's often useful for us to work with you to choose three deep dives each with a different leader if at all possible because this allows for other staff to teach and avoids overloading one person plus it gives us a broader view of leadership so we will want to take time to understand how long that leader has been overseeing the subject and not to overweight surface features of the quality of the curriculum such as how curriculum plans are presented or the leader's own confidence in discussing them we'll think about how you'll be able to show the evidence you want to present and we will explain to leaders what we need to consider during each part of the inspection so that they can contribute to each activity so that inspectors can gain a view there may well be a rough idea discussed on the telephone which is then fully formed when inspectors arrive on site so i'd like to spend a few minutes now talking about deep dives in a little bit more detail we know that deep dives can look very different and we do not have to do everything in a set order but we aim to complete each part of the deep dive the discussion with the head teacher and sometimes other leaders too that enables us to gain that top level view is part of the deep dive however this first diagram at the top of your screen does not reflect the reality of most deep dives 
There is no set equal time given to each activity and we cannot preset the order in which we will carry out each of them on any inspection. The reality is a deep dive in a small school might look much more like the one at the bottom of the screen. We may want to spend more time in lessons to look at specific learning sequences and to see how pupils are achieving in their session. As we may only be speaking to a small number of teachers, possibly only one, we might need much less time to do this. So we will take account of the context of your school when we organise our deep dives in collaboration with you. And in line with paragraph six of our handbook, we do need to balance the consistency of, of inspection with the individual circumstances of your school. And using all the information from our initial telephone conversation, we know that we may need to be even more flexible than just changing some of the timings. We've spent some time speaking to HMI and senior HMI who are established in leading small schools themselves and in leading inspections of small schools, as well as talking to leaders currently of small schools. A consistent feature was the need to take time to understand, and this need has to be planned for. So a deep dive might actually look like the first diagram at the top of this screen. The head teacher may be the only person on the telephone call because everybody else is teaching. Although we would always encourage that head teacher to have someone else with them on the call, they may prefer to continue on their own, and that's absolutely fine. And in order to really understand the curriculum and how it is set out, we may need to continue the conversation about how the curriculum is designed when we get on site. We can also join some deep dive activities together and ensure each one is part of our evidence base. We will also need to build in some time so that leaders and staff in the school are able to be in lessons to teach themselves or to carry out other important school functions and activities such as duty and even being in another meeting. So we may leave gaps in the deep dive for this to happen as demonstrated in the lower diagram on the screen. So it could be that inspectors will be looking at pupils work during that time ready for a discussion with you when you return or they might look at other documentation in the team room. As there will be a small number of teachers in the school it may be sensible to meet them all together and for inspectors to both speak with the group rather than speaking one at a time. This might feel even more supportive for them. So speaking to teachers might be an activity we just do once rather than attaching that activity to each individual deep dive. Also we may be able to plan out our deep dive, but we might need to respond to a school's circumstances live. So once we've met with the subject leader, it might become apparent that something doesn't quite work in the planned timetable that might not have occurred to staff, leaders, or to us until we arrive on site. So our inspection is not about evaluating the school's ability to be inspected, and we need to be agile and adapt to any occurrences as they arise. Keeping in touch meetings provide leaders with an opportunity for a two-way professional dialogue between the inspectors and the leaders. And they are no different in small schools. These meetings are of particular importance in ungraded schools, in ungraded inspections of small schools, where the inspection may be for just one day. On an ungraded inspection, we are inspecting with the assumption that the school remains good or outstanding, so we will keep leaders informed if there is evidence that this may not still be the case. And in line with our code of conduct, we will feed back honestly and clearly with courtesy and sensitivity, and we will respond appropriately to reasonable requests. We all know that these meetings can sometimes involve sharing messages that might be difficult for leaders to hear. And we know that it is important that we listen to what you say in response and we will do our best to take account of that. As much as possible, we will agree actions and explain the process so that you will know what will happen next. It's also important that we are clear about where we have already gathered enough evidence. This can be hard to hear, but it's much better for us to be honest now, remembering that we don't want any surprises later. And so back to our five C's. Remember the education inspection framework is equally ambitious for pupils in all schools, and that includes small schools.
Our framework enables us to make judgments with this ambitious ambition in mind. However, as we discussed at the start, in paragraph six, we need to balance the need for consistency and in inspection with the flexibility required to respond to the individual circumstances of each school. Small schools have their own individual circumstances and we will need to be flexible to respond to those. The five C's help with the consistent aspect of small schools that we need to take time to discuss and understand. So here now on the screen are the takeaway points from our webinar today. We're sharing them with you today and we have already shared them with inspectors too. So I think now I'm going to be handing over to Claire for any questions. Hi, thank you, Di. Um, yeah, we've had a, a, a few questions come in during the course of the webinar, and we also had some questions that were submitted beforehand. So what I'll do is um, pick up on the sort of the main themes that we've had um, and sort of yeah, I'll ask you and Richard so, some questions from, from the group. So um, one of the things that's come through is about um, in, in a small school, um, there are a limited number of people to hold all of the different roles that we know that they need to lead within a school. And we've talked during the course of the webinar about leaders wearing lots of different hats. And we, we, we've got people just wondering, well, how do we take account of the fact that we've got leaders that will do a number of different roles in a small school, whereas perhaps in a larger school, people will only have one or two areas of responsibility. So I don't know whether Richard, you'd be able to just talk us through that, please. Yeah, very, very happy to, Claire. Thanks very much. And I think it's a great question. I think, and that often, uh, I think it's a question that kind of goes to the heart of the experience of, of being in and, and working in and leading small schools. And I think the first thing to say is, is to reassure that, you know, that the, through this training, um, the inspectors are, are, are undertaking themselves if they're going to inspect small schools. Inspectors are aware of this. And it's also important to kind of emphasize that, um, that particularly in respect of the way in which inspectors um, evaluate quality of education, they don't, they don't have a fixed view of what subject leadership um, structures should look like. Um, so, um, so I think it's important to say that, that inspectors will want to speak to those colleagues that you as a, a leader will, will tell them are best place to have discussions with them. And that might include, as Di spoke about earlier in the, in the presentation, around those external collaborators. Um, I think one other uh, aspect uh, of this question as well is that, is that the, the inspection process itself will involve a discussion with you as head teacher about which subjects um, should be selected for deep dives. We try not to choose subjects in, a, in an inspection of a small school that will lead to overburdening one particular person or individual, um, and that includes the head teacher. Um, but, but if it is, of course, necessary to cover maybe one or two subjects led, that's led by one person, and we'll want to create a timetable that's bespoke to the school that spaces out activities or perhaps merges activities. And as we said in the presentation, that timetable itself will be constructed, co-constructed with leaders. Um, so, and I think what one last message maybe to, to reassure is that, that we know that there's a lot going on during an inspection and sometimes people can have different levels of confidence about the content with which they are, are speaking and talking. And will be, it's really important for us as inspectors not to conflate or mix up the confidence um, that a person might express at the top level when communicating about, let's say, the quality of education with the actual quality of education on, on offer. That's very much um, down to the inspector to make sure that they have a range of evidence to ensure themselves of the quality of education in that particular school. Super, thank you, Richard. Um, another sort of theme of questions that's come through is that, again a little bit around um, capacity and again people sort of having lots of different roles in a small school so it might not be possible maybe in a small school um, to develop all of the subjects within the curriculum at the same rate it might be that the development of subjects has to happen on a, a rolling program and schools might do one or two subjects at a time rather than looking at their curriculum as a whole. Um, 
how, how will we consider that on inspection? How will we take that into account? Um, Di, I wondered if you could talk us through that. Uh, yeah, happily, Claire, no problem at all. Um, I think it's important to remember first and foremost that maintaining a good quality of education or an outstanding quality of education even takes hard work and it takes a lot of time. It's certainly not a static process at all. Uh, and in fact, that's recognised in our handbook in the good grade descriptors. And, and we must remember, of course, that schools are run for children, not Ofsted. So if school leaders have identified that improvements need to be made in a subject, then they must crack on and make those improvements uh, because they must do it in the interest of pupils, of course. And to remember, of course, as well, that we don't inspect and make a judgment on individual subjects. Instead, what we do through our methodology in the education inspection framework is we'd look at a sample of subjects through those deep dives, and that would help us to identify strengths and weaknesses across the quality of education as a whole. And inspectors then will come to a rounded view about the quality of education that, that pupils receive. And that evaluation is what's used to determine whether the quality of education is good. Remembering, of course, that in schools with primary aged pupils, uh, we would always do a deep dive into reading and that quality of reading provision uh, really is a core thread that runs through the good grade descriptors. So I suppose what I'm saying is we'd be interested to hear what's happening in that school's curriculum, why leaders have identified that those subjects are in need of development along with the impact of the development of the subjects that they've done so far, that they've focused on improving so far, and that would contribute to helping us to build that rounded view of the quality of education. Super, thank you, Di. I'm aware that we are past five o'clock, but we've perhaps got time if, if panellists are, are happy to continue for a couple more questions. Um, obviously, people that are listening in, if you need to go, we absolutely understand that. Um, but we'll, we'll perhaps do another, another couple before we finish. So, um, okay. Uh, and another question that's come in is around um, returns to the parent survey. So um, obviously in a small school, there are less parents to respond to that survey. It might be that not every parent takes up the opportunity to respond to the survey. So how will, how will that work when we're inspecting if there are very few or indeed no responses to the parent survey? Uh, Richard, I wondered if you could talk us through that, please. Uh, of course, Claire. Um... I think the first thing to say is, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, we use data sets based on small numbers with caution. And we talked about that, didn't we, in terms of pupil absence, pupil achievement and attainment. And I think the same principle there applies for surveys. Um, what, what, what we will want to do is to discuss, you know, obviously the, the school's wider context um, to get a, a rounded picture of, of uh, of the, the you know the quality of education and care that the school offers and where there are very few parental or staff or pupil responses we we'll want to, to gather evidence that 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 is all, all that's you know all the evidence that's relevant and that might actually be from your own surveys or other engagement activities with stakeholders and and we, we might talk to, to parents outside of the school gate as well um so so in respect of the, the number that you're saying um or talking about we, we evaluate the views of parents as part of that, that that rounded picture, but we we don't pay necessarily a, a lot of disproportionate attention to the amount of responses that we get, because we know that that that, that um, we have to treat small numbers with caution. Thank you, Richard. Um, a question that's come in sort of live from the floor. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll um, probably answer this one as it's come through. So um, people asking if a head teacher, for example, can join um, an inspector meeting with a subject leader um, if, they're, if they're talking about the curriculum, maybe if that subject leader is new. So just to be um, you know, really, really clear, it's up to you as a school who attends meetings with inspectors. So if you would like the head teacher or, or indeed another member of staff to join that subject leader conversation, then that is absolutely fine. And our, our handbook now sets that out clearly. And it, it is absolutely up, up to you to decide who you would like in that meeting. And if it's helpful to have the head teacher there or indeed, if if the subject is being led across a number of schools within a federation or a trust, then absolutely fine to have those other members of staff in that meeting if that's manageable for you as a school. 
And then I think di a, a, a final question um, that, that's come in um, around sort of the offer for personal development. Um, maybe if a small school is, is in an isolated location and it's difficult or, or expensive to organise those trips and visits out of school, perhaps to places of worship, theatres, etc. Um, how will that impact in terms of inspectors' evaluation of personal development? Yeah, again, really good question uh, there, Claire. Thank you for that. And it comes back to a word that we've been talking about all the way through this webinar, I think, and that's about context and the school's local context. And it's really important that inspectors will want to understand how leaders have adapted their personal development offer and provision to take account of the context and the needs of the children that attend the school. We absolutely understand that trips and visits to places of worship, art galleries, theatres, all of these things and many, many more these days particularly can be incredibly costly. And if you are a small school that's in an isolated spot, perhaps um, that, that cost is amplified even further. There are many, many ways that schools provide good or even better personal development provision for pupils. This is not just about a list of visits that might be on offer. This is about all those other things that you do because you know the context of your school and you know the children that attend. So lots and lots that schools can bring uh, and share with us there. Lovely, thank you very much, Di. Um, Richard, if I hand over to you then um, for the final part of the webinar. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, Claire, and, and also Di for, for answering those questions. So I think you just, uh, I should say a few final remarks as we bring our webinar to a close. It, it just remains for me to thank you for your interest and participation. So on, on behalf of the whole team here, uh, on behalf of uh, Lee, Di, Claire, myself, and all the staff behind the scenes, uh, huge thanks uh, for joining. We do hope you found it useful and interesting. So thanks again for joining and we wish you all the very best.